that you were joining me today. Today we're going to continue talking about forgiveness is the highest and greatest act of love. And we're continuing talking about Job. As you know from previous segments, we're talking about how Job was a wealthy man and he lived in the, the city of Uz. And uh, Satan had came to uh, God and petitioned him for his soul. Of course, that's the bottom line. He ultimately wanted his soul. But God said, no, you can have, he says, if you take away, Satan says, if you take away everything he has, then he will curse you and die. But God says, okay, you can take away what he has. He took away all of his possessions, and instead of Job cursing God, he praised God. And then Job, and then Satan came back to God and asked him again, and this time he, Satan afflicted Job with boils, which were really superficial because if you read the Bible, you'll see that it says that Job then he flicked the uh, thing off of his skin and it fell to the ground. Okay, if you have uh, that kind of stuff on you, it's not going to come off that easy. And he told his wife, his wife said, why don't you just curse God and die? She, everybody else had already thought that he was, he was finished, that he was done. But that wasn't the case. How many of y'all know, once Jesus comes to town, baby, everything's going to be aight. And now, we're going to, and my name is Dr. Sylvia Black. And I'm the author of this book. This book will soon be available. If you're interested in pre-ordering, you can email me at the address at the bottom of the screen. Now, 2 Corinthians 10, 2 Corinthians 2, 10 to 11, ESB says, Anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive. Indeed, what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, has been for your sake in the presence of Christ, so that we would not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and doing of his mighty, powerful, and magnanimous word. Now, God discipline, God's discipline proves His love. Now, some of us are sinners and have sinned in our heart and don't even know it. Uh, Hebrews 12, 1-4, New no Living Translation says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life and faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us, we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding the shame. Uh, he endured from uh, uh, disregarding the shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor besides God's throne. Think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people. And then you won't become weary and give up. After all, you have not yet given your lives in the struggle against sin. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading here and doing of his mighty powerful and magnanimous word. Now that, that has a lot of significance to it because, you know, Jesus died on the cross to save our sins. And they, there was a lot of hostility that was exhibited towards Jesus. You know, they did a lot of things to him and they wanted the man dead. They wanted him out of, out of town. You know, the enemy probably wants you and I dead too, but now there's, you know, criminal penalties that they, they would have to suffer as a result of that. Okay, uh, but it says that, you know, we, uh, we perfects our faith, okay, which is the opposite of fear, because of the joy that is awaiting him. He endured the cross, disregarding the shame. He just said, you know, ain't no shame in my game, you know, I'm, so what, you know, there, there is shame, but Jesus disregarded it. You know, he said, shame is not as important as, as his mission, as, as what he had to accomplish. It's not half as important as that. So... You know, the shame was nothing. That was mediocre to him. And that's what a lot of us should feel too, you know. Shameful situations. A lot of times we don't want to do things or we don't want to go places or whatever because we feel shameful or whatever. Or you feel ashamed of what happened to you in the past or because of what somebody did to you. And you're like, oh man, look at what they did to me. You know, you might even have a couple of scars or whatever. Or you might, you know, be injured as a result of, you know, the infliction that they caused upon you. And you say, hey. You know, you're ashamed to do this or ashamed to do that because of what you think people are thinking about you. But what you think about me is none of my business, you know. It's what God thinks about me. Okay, it's what my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ has to say about me, honey, that really matters. Okay. 
So some of us are not exhibiting faith in God, which we are supposed to be exhibiting if we want to please God. Okay. Hebrews 11.6, New King James Version says, But without faith it is impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. In Job 33.12, New Living Translation, Job is praising God. Okay. Okay, let's go back a little bit. Uh, that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Okay, so that means that, you know, the more you seek God, the more you try to look for God, the more you try to build a relationship with God, you know, He's going to reward you. He's going to look out for His own. He's going to look out for His people. Okay, um, there's no doubt about that. Okay, uh, Jesus, you know, he, he rewards us, you know. And a lot of times you say, well, you know, why is it taking so long or whatever? Or you may not get what you think you want, but you're, you're, you're really being blessed on a daily basis. And a lot of people don't even realize how blessed they really are. Because what you feel being blessed is what you want. And you're looking at it in an abundant way. You want that big house with the five bedrooms in it, you know, that's sitting on top of the hill. But instead, God bless you with a nice apartment, you know, or, you know, or someplace, or maybe even a smaller house. You know, somewhere that you might even be renting instead of owning for the time being. But that doesn't mean that God's not going to bless you with something that you're going to own down the road. See, so you have to be thankful for what you have in order for God to move you to your next level. But you have to continue to seek Him, not the objects, not the things, not the possessions. You seek God, and God will be the one that will, will, that will reward us for the uh, things that we want and need, as long as it lines up with His Word. And most of the times, once you're a follower of Jesus Christ, and you have built a relationship with God, anything that you want is going to line up with God's will. Because everything that we want lines up with what He wants us to, to have and to do. You know, sometimes it may be a little bit, the timing may be off a little. You know, it may be a little, you know, uh, something may be altered a little bit, maybe a little different. You may have to do something differently, whatever. You might have to go in another direction. But ultimately, it will be the same. It will be for God's glory. And you and I that are sent, we are going to get blessed. Okay? <clears throat> now, some of us are not exhibiting faith in God, uh, uh, which is displeasing to God. I believe I said that. Okay, in Job 33, 12, New Living Translation, Job is praising God. But you are wrong, he says. I will show you why. For God is, is greater than any human being. See, now God is, I mean, now Job is like, uh, really, you know, he's praising the Lord. He's elaborating on him. He's making... He's enlarging his God and minimizing his problems. Ooh, come on, somebody talk to me. I got another book that I talk about that. Your giants are big because you think small. So see, that's what's happening right here. Job is now enlarging his God, and that's what we need to do. We need to enlarge our God. You know, my God is bigger than you. I got a song. That's a song I sing. My God is bigger than you. God. My God is bigger than yours. My God is bigger because he answers blessings. My God is bigger than yours. That's a song that I made up. And I sing it to myself sometimes, you know. And, um, you know, as a reminder, you know, and I enlarge my God. Hey, my God can do anything but fail. Look at me, baby. I'm a product of what God has already done, you know, because I have been through the hell and high water, okay? And, and, and I ain't stopped. I'm still swimming through it, <laughs> you know? And so God ain't through with me yet, honey. And I ain't giving up on me. I ain't giving up on God. I'm none of that, okay? So we have to... Uh, He's enlarging God now. He's, you know, he's, he's elaborating. You know, God is, is, you know, you're wrong. You know, I'll show you why. You know, he already, he already was blessed at one time. So that was proof positive right there that he was definitely will show you. That was in his action. And he didn't have to do anything. I don't have to do nothing. I don't have to say nothing to you. You know, you, you can look and see that, that God is in the blessing business, you know, because Job was being blessed by abundance. You know, God took it away from him, but... You know, he had it at one time, up until this point right here. Now, you see the pattern, though. First Job loses everything. Well, not everything, though. He doesn't lose his soul. He doesn't lose his dignity. He still has his, his mind and his heart is still intact, his faith. A lot of things that money can't buy. He got his peace. He has all of that. He has a whole lot of stuff. He doesn't lose everything. See, a lot of people think they lose everything. When you lose your money, you lose everything. When you lose your house, you lose everything. You know, no, you don't lose everything. You know, because if you lost everything, then you'd probably be dead. You know, but then again, that's not a loss either, because if you go into heaven to be with the Lord, you didn't lose in that capacity either. But see, first Job loses everything, okay? 
So like when, when, when some of us lose our job or something, when you do something, and then, you know, you, then you think of the loss instead of the God who caused the loss. You know, you say, you think of the loss as it, it is all you ever going to have and that there will never be another in your mind. This is what you're thinking about that. All you're thinking about is the pain of that loss of that particular, now you're without that thing. Okay, and and then he feels sorry for himself. You know, in the beginning of the uh, uh, the scripture, okay, he feels sorry for himself, and then he starts to lose hope. You know, he starts to say, "Why was he even born?" and stuff like that. You know, he starts to, you know, do things like that. He starts to put, you know, point the finger at himself now instead of at God. You know, uh, like a lot of times when we do, when we think the worst of ourselves instead of thinking. And sometimes when you pray for a better job and you're sitting behind a desk at a job that you don't like or that you really, you know, would rather not be at, you know, you'd rather be somewhere else or whatever, or you don't mind being there, you're putting up with it or what have you. And you be like, you know, you ask God, Lord, I need a better job. Can you give me a better paying job? La, 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 la. And then all of a sudden you lose that job. And then you wonder, you know, why did I lose a job? And then you cry and boo and ranting and raving and whatnot because you lost a job, forgetting that you had prayed to God and asked God for a better job. And that that was probably his answer to you in getting you a better job. Because you have to lose that one in order to get another one. You could have found another one while you was working there and you could have just quit or got fired. You know. But God could have been answering your prayer inadvertently and you didn't even realize that he had answered your prayer. You prayed for it and, and you know, and, and then all of a sudden God answers it. But now this this is how God answers prayers. You know, you don't throw, you don't drop the money down in your lap. You got to go through some hell and hot water, baby, to get to it. You know, like there's a movie, The Shawshank Redemption, uh, that I saw. You know, uh, I'm sure a lot of people probably saw it where um, Morgan Freeman and uh, what's the name played in it. He was falsely accused of killing his wife, and he spent quite a few years behind bars. Um, and uh, all the years, he became the accountant for the warden. And he put a couple of cents, he created a person, a fictitious person, birth certificate, everything, with his person, and he started um, depositing money into the bank for this person. Okay, several years later, he plotted and planned his escape because he knew he wasn't going to get out of there. And he uh, finally got out. He went to the bank where he had the money at, and he claimed the money. But before that, as he was out on his way out of the prison, he swam through... Uh, several football fields of mess and stuff and junk to get to the sunshine to the other side and that's what a lot of times you and I have to do we have to climb through or crawl through or swim through the mess and the stuff and the junk in order to get to the sunshine you know in order to get to the blessing that God has for us it's, it's, the, it's a test it's to determine your faith it's to determine where you are in Christ and it's to mature a lot of us, you know, a lot of us to say, well, hey, you know, are you going to reach, are you going to trust me in this? You just ask me for a home, just like the Israelites when they prayed to get uh, be free from slavery. And God finally answered their prayer. And then they was bickering and complaining when they were free. Come on. You know, they claimed they would rather have stayed a slave than to have been free. After you prayed and prayed and prayed for all them years to be free. So what did God do? Allowed them to wander in the wilderness until they died. And they continued to be a slave. They were free in their body. Their body was free. But they still remained a slave because they never got to the promised land so that they could live a free life. You see what happens? Don't, don't, you don't ask for something you don't want. You just might get what you ask for. So, okay, so now you see the pattern here. Okay, so God had heard, you know. So then the very woman that Job is married to now. Okay, the love of his life, you know, comes to curse him and says, why don't you just curse God and die? And why did God leave her around, you know? He destroyed, he allowed his children to be destroyed and all his property. Why leave this woman around, you know? But you see what's coming out of her mouth, right? So, and you know, and he says, you know, now it's time for divorce. Well, somebody say that for me. You know, why don't you just curse God and die? Well, man, I'm going to divorce God. Man, I'm going to divorce God. You know, when your husband or your wife starts talking like that, it's time to come out from among them and with a quickness. Okay, the Bible also says in 2 Corinthians 6, 17, New King's Day Version, Wherefore come out from among them and be ye separate with equal. Okay, said the Lord, and touch not any unclean thing, and I will receive you. This is one of my favorite scriptures in Job 33, 14 to 26, King James Version. Okay, and it reads thusly. 
For God speaketh once and twice, uh, yet man perceiveth it not. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falleth upon men, in slumberings upon the bed, then he openeth the ears of men and sealeth their instructions. Uh, then he, uh, that he may withdraw man from his purpose and hide pride from man. He keepeth back his soul from the pit. Uh oh. Okay. He keepeth back his soul from the pit. And his life from perishing by the sword. He is chastened also with pain upon the bed, and the multitude of his bones with strong pain, so that the life abhorreth bread, and his soul dainty meat. His flesh is consumed away, that it cannot be seen, and his bones that were not seen stick out. Yea, his soul draweth near unto the grave, and his life to the destroyers. If there be a messenger with him, an interpreter, one among a thousand, to shoot unto man in uprightness. Then he is gracious unto him, and saith, Deliver him from going down into the pit. I have found a ransom. His flesh shall be fresher than a child's. He shall return to the days of his youth. He shall pray unto God, and he will be favorable unto him. And he shall see his face with joy, for he will render unto man his righteousness. May the Lord have a blessing to the reading here and doing of his powerful and magnanimous word. Now, you know, a special messenger will come and intercede on your behalf. You pray unto God and, you know, you will be healed and delivered. A lot of times God is trying to get messages across to us. Like I was saying earlier, you pray for something and you don't even realize that God answered your prayer because all you think about is the tragedy that's happening, the trauma. Which in reality, that's not what we should be thinking about. We should be thinking about the God that delivers us. Sometimes you can't even ask Him, God, what is, what is the message behind this mess? You know, what, what, what am I dealing with? What is it that you're trying to tell me? Okay, now the Lord blesses Job when he forgives. Okay, Job 42, 7 to 12, New Living Translation says, After the Lord had finished speaking to Job, he said to El Eliphaz and Temanite, I am angry with you for your, and your two friends. Okay, for you have not spoken accurately of me as my servant Job has and taking several bulls and seven rams and go and take seven bulls and seven rams and go to my servant Job after a burnt offering for yourself and offer a burnt offering for yourself. My servant Job will pray for you and I will accept his prayer okay on your behalf uh, I will not treat you as you deserve for you have not spoken accurately about me as my servant Job has. So Eliphaz and Temanite, Bildad and Shuhite and Zophar and Namathite did as the Lord commanded them and the Lord accepted Job's prayer. When Job prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his fortunes. In fact, the Lord gave him twice as much as before. Then all his brothers, sisters and former friends came and feasted with him in his home. And they uh, consoled him and comforted him and because of all the trials the Lord had brought up against him and each of them brought him a gift of money and a gold ring. So the Lord blessed Job in the second half of his life even more than in the beginning. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and doing of his mighty powerful and magnanimous word. So what does that mean? We have to pray for our friends. And we have to pray for our enemies. Okay? We pray for our friends and our enemies. Don't just pray for your enemies. Pray for your friends too. Okay? We must speak correctly, truthfully, and precisely of the Lord when we speak of Him to and to Him. When we speak of Him and to Him, we must pray with our friends. We must pray for our friends. We must forgive all who have wronged us, especially our friends and relatives. We must not turn our back on God. We must always keep that line of communication open with Him, trusting and believing in Him that even though you did not see a way know that God is making a way out of no way for you. Job experienced great personal suffering, first through the loss of his wealth and of all ten of his children in one single day. And then, soon after, through the loss of his own physical health, he endured these painful afflictions without compassionate or wise support 
from his wife or his closest friend, the mother of his children, okay? And yet pers persevered in faith and trusted in the Lord's timing. Job 3.25 Job says, What I always feared has happened to me. What I dreaded has come true. I have no peace, no quietness. I have no rest, only troubles come. That's the statement that I was elaborating on based on the basis of Job. He was afraid all oh, for a long time that he was gonna lose his wealth and it finally came upon him. And I believe that was another reason why God had allowed Satan to take away his, his uh, possessions because he was afraid. He should have been faithful. He should have had faith and trust in God more than being afraid. What are you afraid of? Did you steal those donkeys? Did you steal, you know, did you have an affair with somebody else when you got when you all had them children? No, you ain't got nothing to be afraid of. You don't have no reason to be afraid. Okay? And, and, and but he was. And so God had to teach him, and that's what he does with us. He teaches us things in the lessons that we uh, endure. A lot of times we go through things, we go through stuff and mess and junk, and a lot of times when you wonder why am I going through all this hell and I water? And a lot of times it's so that you can, God can teach us uh, certain things, you know, so that he, we can learn from our mistakes, you know, become stronger soldiers in his army. Um, we can find out what it is we need to do to forge ahead, what it is that we're lacking, what it is that we're missing, and a, and a, and a variety of things like that, you know. Now I'm going to talk uh, about a little bit about fear, okay, and this is probably going to overlap into my YouTube channel. I'm going to let you, so you're going to have to check out my YouTube channel to see the balance of it, okay. Now fear can either be real or imagined. Some of us, like was the case with Job, are fearful. Even though we are blessed by God, fear, of the opposite, fear is the opposite of faith. God is pleased with us when we have faith in Him. Joshua 1 9 ESV says, Have I not commanded you to be strong uh, and courageous? Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Now, matter of fact, I may just have this as a segment by itself. Okay, when you go on my YouTube channel. Uh, if you did something to cause yourself to be afraid, then you have reason to fear. If you did nothing to cause yourself to be afraid, then you should not have any reason to fear. No reason to look over your shoulders, think somebody coming after you. No reason to think that somebody is, you know, is going to get you back with the wrong that you did. Because you didn't do anything. Imagined fear that is inflicted upon us by the enemy. The enemy uses fear as to intimidate us. Imagined fear is fear that is inflicted on us by the enemy. They use fear to intimidate us, to make us doubt ourselves. Make us doubt our salvation and all of that. Make us doubt what we believe. Okay, anxiety can be associated with the nervous system. It can give you the shakes, make you nervous. Almost like uh, a person who drinks too much alcohol, who don't have the alcohol for the day. Others will see you in distress and some will pounce on you because they think that you're afraid. And they think that you're an easy target. Fear can lead you to panic at the sight of the person inflicting the fear upon you or even cause you to become frightful because of your own thoughts. You think someone which is the opposite of uh, faith, you become, you think something which is the opposite of faith. You become terrorized, your alarm button goes off. And only you can hear the alarm, all because of imagined fear. You spoke fear into the atmosphere, you gave fear life, you allowed fear to dominate you and take over your faith. Fear leads to trepidation and apprehension. Now you have incarcerated your mind and then your body becomes imprisoned by the fear that you spoke into existence. When you're afraid, you tend to worry more. You may even have nightmares during the day, all because of what you thought up in your mind. Your phobia, your dread is yours. You gave it life and only you can send it to the grave and bury it. Philippians 4, 6-7, New King James Version says, Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and the minds to Christ Jesus. If you are the persecutor, you may have good reason to be afraid, knowing that the, the ones you hurt could come back at you and hurt you. That's enough to be afraid of. That's a good reason for you to look over your shoulders and wondering if somebody's coming after you. Hurting people hurt people. 
Someone hurt you, so now it's your turn to hurt someone else. You're really getting the person back who hurt you, but that person is not there who hurt you. So you pick on the innocent bystander, anybody, just somebody you think is a weaker vessel, and then you pounce. If you're the one who suffered at the hands of someone who hurt you, the unforgiveness in your heart may cause you to dwell on what the enemy did to you. The remembrance could cause you to become afraid. Afraid of the enemy finishing the job. Afraid to walk the streets. Afraid to live your life. Afraid of your own capability and your own shadow. You could become possessed with evil and dread revenge. Whenever the thought of retaliation comes to mind, overpower it with forgiveness. Say it out loud to yourself so you can hear yourself saying it. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The thought of reprisal may sound and feel good, but just speaking retribution out of your mouth could cause you to feel retaliation in your heart and even perhaps act on it. Maybe not to them, but to someone else. You may send some innocent bystander blubbering into the, into the sunset, and he or she had nothing to do with it. Or even hurt someone because there's no one else to hurt. I used to figure that the drama would drown out the trauma. But then the drama turned into trauma and the situation seemed to be repeating itself. It was destroying me. I was sinking deeper and deeper into the abyss and my situation wasn't getting any better. I had to come out of that black hole and with the quickness. Mostly I had to come out from among them who was causing the drama. So you take what the enemy did to you and you take it out on yourself. Changing your final destination from eternal salvation to eternal damnation. And that's not good. None of us really want to do that. Okay. So I'm going to conclude with that. Okay. And uh, there's, that's, there's some more in the chapter. But you're going to need to get the book in order to... I'm skimming through, really. I'm talking, doing a lot more talking about it. There's a lot of stuff in the book that, that I'm not saying on camera. So you're going to have to get the book in order to really get into the... So that it can the, the, the words can talk directly to you. Okay? So my name is Dr. Sylvia Black. And I just want to ask you to holler at a sister. And uh, we're talking about some more interesting topics. Forgiveness is the highest and greatest act of love. Which you will find out in your heart. And I hope that this message is helping you. Because as I encourage you, I am encouraging myself. So my name is Dr. Sylvia Black, and I'm going to ask you to holler at the sister next time. And I'll see you. Peace out.